by Simon Hogg, followed by Janet Stewart's presentation. I will be reading Catherine Alexander's presentation, and then Simon will be presenting Damien Hampshire's. Um, but before we get to all that, I want to, uh, we're very, very pleased to have uh, a special moderator here today, Neil Lane, uh, physicist by training, science advisor to Bill Clinton, who worked for the National Science Foundation uh, for, for some years as well, also formerly the provost of Rice University, and somebody who cares a great deal about our energy and environmental challenges, in particular climate change. So we're really, really very happy to have him here moderating this discussion, which is going to take us from you know the humanities to technology and back again on the topic of a nuclear future. So please join me in welcoming you all. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm really excited to join you at this event today. It's something I care a lot about, as Dominic said. Uh, and I want to make a brief comment, one minute or so, before introducing our speakers. That's really why we're all here. So this session, uh, a nuclear future has question mark by it, so it poses a question. We all have questions about that, but I'll just say there are things like, will the world have a nuclear future? What might it look like? How can we ensure it'll be good for humanity? What are the alternatives to a nuclear future? And I'm sure other questions that are more profound that are going to come up in the uh, presentations and in the discussion. Um, as with energy, with, as with any technology, actually, including energy technologies, nuclear power poses risks. But unlike in the other energy technologies, anything nuclear somehow draws a reaction from the general public that is special. It has a lot to do with history, it has a lot to do with things you can't see, but haunt you and uh, things you read about, things you hear about. So that's an issue that we all have to contend with. And we're going to hear some informed views on the possible uh, nuclear future, and I certainly look forward to those presentations. Let me say a word about energy humanities, about which I'm just learning. Uh, I have always felt that academic scholars, whatever their field, ought to be able to uh, work on anything they like, whether it has any possibility of utility or not. The university is sort of about the last place on earth where one can, uh, where smart people can actually use their creativity and their intellectual strengths to create new ideas and artistic works and uh, discover scientific uh, new, new uh, things in science and new technologies or whatever moves them. But actually, I think those scholars who do decide to work in areas that have a potential positive impact for humanity uh, deserve some special attention. Uh, so I'm especially excited about the emergence, the emergence of the energy humanities and this cultures of energy symposium. The world obviously has a big challenge. It doesn't yet know how to meet. Hopefully something can do. So the demand for energy is growing. Fossil energy, many of us believe, coal, oil, natural gas, is likely to be with us for a very long time. Uh, carbon is building up in the atmosphere. Climate is changing and it's likely to have a devastating impact on most of the world's population, but in particular, those people who really don't currently enjoy a good life, energy or, uh, or money or food or quality health care or anything else. And often I'm disturbed when I hear from environmental organizations, not everybody, obviously, the policies that they advocate often sound a lot like policies that will keep the underprivileged underprivileged and let the rest of us do whatever we want to do. It's obviously the wrong direction for humanity and for the world. And, and maybe I've overstated what I hear, so I guess what I would suggest is we really do need to be clear, those of us who care about these issues, uh, what we think are appropriate things to do. Now, uh, we're going to need new energy technologies to deal with the world challenge. The former Rice Professor Rick Smalley, who did win a Nobel Prize, unlike yours truly, uh, for the discovery of Buckyballs with the other Rice Professor Bob Curl and UK Sussex Professor Harry Croto. Um, uh, Rick Smalley, before his death in 2005 from cancer, often talked around, walk, walk, went all around the world talking about the top 10 world problems. And they're the kind of things we might put on the list, they have to do with 
with water and they have to do with food and they have to do with energy. But Rick and many others, Rick always put energy at the very top because his point was, unless we figure out how to deal sustainably with the energy issue, we don't have much of a chance dealing with all of these other issues on the list. Rick was all about new technologies, nanotechnology in particular, <clears throat> but I think he was right. Anyway, when we need those new technologies, the most difficult hurdles, I think, uh, have to do with people. So their human beliefs, their values, understanding about technology and everything else in life, their human behavior, how people choose to govern themselves or are governed without their consent. Um, these kinds of things relate to policy. It's the kind of thing we do at the Baker Institute or try to do at the Baker Institute. Ideally, policy is based on evidence, on logic, and on basic humanity. But policy is imperfect, just as the people who make it are imperfect, as are the people who are governed are imperfect. I would say the U.S. Congress is a really good example right now, but uh, that's the most I'll say about current politics. The energy humanities area, as I understand the field, endeavors to tap the electric capital of many disciplines to seek solutions or at least options that will offer people choices. And so I want to applaud this ambitious effort. I want to thank you again for including me in this uh, fascinating program. So now the really substantive part of the discussion. I have the pleasure of introducing two of our speakers. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Simon Hogg is Executive Director of the Durham Energy Institute in the School of Engineering and Computer Sciences at Durham University. He's a mechanical engineer with specific expertise in analytical, experimental, computational fluid dynamics, turbo machinery, aerodynamics, thermodynamics, and heat transfer. His research interests lie in the general area of power generation, turbo machinery. The son graduated with a Bachelor of Science and PhD from the University of Manchester in the 1980s. His PhD study was funded by Rolls-Royce, uh, and so they gave him a Rolls-Royce <laughs> today for predicting gas turbine swirl stabilized combustor flows, which I think don't have to do with cars, maybe but with bigger things that Rolls-Royce makes. Following graduation, he held the University Post for 10 years, both as a Rolls-Royce funded research fellow at Oxford and later as a lecturer in engineering at Leicester. In 1998, he joined Alstom's ALSTOM's power division, initially working in steam and turbine R&D, and then in 2003 to 10, the company's steam turbine retrofit business. During his period, this period, he held senior management technical leadership positions in tendering and eventually as engineering director of the turbine retrofit business. He returned to academia in January 2010, was recruited back to, to uh, academia, taking a position as reader of the School of Engineering in the School of Engineering and Computer Sciences. Simon is the principal investigator of the SuperGen uh, 5 Wind General uh, Gen Wind Energy Technologies Consortium. It's funded by the UK's uh, Research Council on Engineering and Physical Sciences. And he has technical leadership of the condition monitoring asset management aspects of the consortium's work. He's also the principal investigator of the recently awarded Research Council Future Conventional Power Research Consortium, which will consider the effect of the change in power makes from the growth of wind on the flexible operating requirements of conventional steam and gas power plant. In addition, Simon currently holds a number of industrial funded research grants on new turbine technologies. And he's going to talk first on the Durham Energy Institute and overview and many other things. Our, next, our second speaker will be Janet Stewart. Dr. Stewart was appointed professor of visual culture of Durham University in January 2014, where she's also director of the Center for Visual Arts and Cultures. Previously, she was senior lecturer in German and film and visual culture at the University of Aberdeen, where she founded and directed a master's program in visual culture, was instrumental in the development of a new undergraduate comparative literature program, literature in a world context, and was lead supervisor on a college-funded research project on translating cultures. In 1995, she was a junior fellow at the International Research Center for Cultural Sciences of Vienna, and in 77-78 held a, uh, a Levenholm Trust study abroad a studentship at the Karl Everhart's University of Tübingen. Janet received a PhD in German Sociology at the University of Glasgow in 1998. Her research is characterized by a commitment to interdisciplinary work grounded in disciplinary knowledge. Main research intersects <coughs> lie in visual culture, publishing widely on Austrian German literature and visual culture, uh, cultural sociology, 
and urban history in producing two monographs called Fashion in Vienna, Adolf Lutz's Cultural Criticism, 2000, and Public Speaking in the City, 2009, uh, subtitled Debating and Shaping the Urban Experience. Her current research project develops her interest in modern modernity and the visual culture in a new context, connecting them to the emerging field of energy and humanities, which we'll hear about today, with a specific focus on theoretical and cultural approaches to oil. She's so working on a research monograph, Curating Europe's Oil, which explores the role of oil plays in 21st century cultural memory. And this work involves constructing an adequate theoretical framework for the project that acknowledges and builds upon critical approaches drawn from a variety of interrelated fields, including critical theory, energetic sociology, film studies, visual culture studies, <clears throat> and museum studies, and drawing together case study materials from these fields with a focus on works deriving from Europe. Now, that sounds like a major research project, and we look forward to that book. So the title of Janet's talk is Nuclear Power Nine Donkey, which I think means no thank you, Nuclear Energy in the Austrian culture of imaginary. So we'll let everybody come up in order, but we'll start with Simon Hall. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to destroy some myths from the start, I don't drive a Rolls Royce. The reality is I have a 1996 Volvo. <laughs> so, what, uh, so what different uh, type of car? Really? I also have an electric bike, by the way, so I do live the dream to some extent. Uh, so we're sorry that things have gone against us a little bit. The, the intention um, to, to use this slot, we're very grateful uh, to Dominic and his team for inviting us over here. Um, we have an institute in Durham, I can tell you about that in the first presentation. We've been going a little bit longer than your institute since 2009, so we're a little bit further down the road. Uh, Dominic and some of they spend time with us, know, know quite a bit about this. Uh, hopefully, uh, I can run through 20 minutes and likewise increase the general awareness of what the Durham Energy Institute is all about. So that's really the, the point of the first uh, presentation. And really to explain, let's well, go through that presentation, really why we're here today, why, why you're important to us as well. We then have uh, to, to try and um, uh, underline the interdisciplinary nature of our institute. We came up with these four presentations around the general theme of nuclear and tried to get them to span all faculties of the university to show, to show how we engage in topics in energy research, not just from the scientific point of view, but also from social science and the arts and humanities. So we've lost one of those four again because unfortunately um, um, one of the, the people who wanted to say is uh, Connor's illness has prevented him. Uh, so we don't have that presentation, but we still have three good presentations that do do span faculties of the university. So hopefully that will help to read. Okay, so I've got the not going to go time to change slides. So you've heard about me, that's me in a nutshell. I'm, I'm different to, well, I don't know about here in the US, I'm, I'm, I'm different to most of the UK in, in the, uh, sort of like myself who's spent half of his career in industry and half in academia. Uh, UK universities are definitely a lot of us, uh, we've had a full of us, but they, uh, one or two of us seem to go down well. So I've had a lot of fun in the last five years uh, since I returned to academia from industry. And uh, that's culminated really about uh, 18 months ago now, where I was given stewardship of the Durham Energy Institute for the next phase of its growth. So, so prior to that, it was started off by um, a guy called Richard Davis from Durham University. He's visited here at Rice. Some of you may have met Richard when he came previously, so, so he was the uh, founder really of the Institute for the, for the first four or five years of its existence. There was a short period where, where we had a a second um, um, uh, executive director who, who uh, just did it for a year or so in the night of COVID in uh, March last year, I think it was, and I'm really committed to, to moving forward with it, uh, as I say, through the next phase of its growth. So, a bit of, just to get us going, a bit of history where is Durham, there's Durham. Now, as you can see from this slide, See from this slide here, I pitched this from the University of Stirling's website, that's why it's in red, so ignore that completely. <laughs> but that's where Durham is, okay? So nowhere near London, that's the first thing I forget. England gets, I'm a northerner, I come from the north, England gets better the further up. 
and we're right there in the, in the heart of the north. Anyway, just just underneath the underneath Newcastle. Uh, so uh, to be perfectly honest with you, if you visit Durham, it's not like the rest of, of the surrounding area. So this is Durham. That's Durham Cathedral in the background there. Cobble Street leading up to it. Does this bring back memories? Uh, so very very historic city. That's another view of it. So you can see the cathedral there. And then next to it, on the, on the left hand side here, that's the castle. Um, and the oldest bit to take back to the 1100s, and that's now in the university's colleges, so students live in that now. And uh, guests can be put did you, go, did you go to the castle? Yeah, you can go and dine in there, people can stay in there. So we've got a lot of history um, around Durham. It's got a river that runs through it. The cathedral was built uh, where it was because the river, the river Weir there, flows into the North Sea at Sunderland, but when you get to Durham, it forms a horseshoe type uh, shape. And the castle is built on what we call the peninsula, so the centre of the horseshoe, it was obviously a cathedral they were put there for defensive reason, a region, reasons in the Middle Ages. So it's a beautiful place to live, but I would want to certainly um, regard myself as, as very lucky to live there. It's not all history though. Uh, this is the science site, it's on the south side of the, uh, of the city, so there's a new purpose built. Um, uh, facility which houses most of the science and engineering departments of the university. So this building on the on the left hand side there, that's, that's the front face of engineering um, uh, where I'm based <coughs> and you can see other, other, other departments as you as you move up into the distance there. So that's us, that's what we look like. Now this is Durham University as well. So those you'll see this colour a lot, the purple in the background there, that's everywhere at Durham, that's the university. It's on the logo. The three vertical bars at the back there, that, that encapsulates Durham University. So Durham is arranged around three faculties. So there's the science faculty, which has all the parts that you would expect, so engineering, physics, chemistry, maths. So uh, social science and health, that contains not only anthropology, geography, uh, classical social sciences, the business school uh, sits within that faculty as well. And then arts and humanities, English. Etc. over on the right hand side there. The departments of the university, there's 24 of them, they all, they all sit within, within those three, or one of those three departments, so roughly eight, eight departments per, per faculty. There's a lot of parallels between Durham and Rice University, we're very similar in many respects. <coughs> um, the reason why I think anyway the, the Durham Energy Institute is successful is the right sort of animal to make it so. If you want to link the sciences with the social sciences and the arts of humanities, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. So if you're going to be successful, you need an environment where you can have not much politics, not much inertia, and good people. And that's what we have at Durham. You know, we are, we are, I'm told to say, a medium-sized university. The reality is, in the UK, we're, a, we're, a, we're one of the smaller universities uh, within the UK, um, like yourselves here, here in the US. Uh, we have very high quality academics like yourselves here, here in the UK, uh, here in the US. Um, and so, because of our size and, and our quality, and the fact that we don't have as much politics and as much inertia as some of our larger counterparts, it, it should be easier for us to be able to get the sciences taught to the social sciences, <coughs> taught to arts and humanities in a, in a meaningful way. So that's what that's what we do, and that's the reason for the the institute to exist is to create that. In, not, not just interdepartmental, in that interfaculty relationships. If, if it was just a case of engineering talking to earth sciences, you wouldn't need the Durham Energy Institute. I can, I can walk next door and talk to my earth science colleagues, and we more or less talk the same language, not, not quite. You know, I'm an engineer, it's a flow rate, it comes in, okay, I'm a European engineer, excuse me, it comes in kilograms per second, if I was a US engineer, it comes in, in pounds per second, and I. I, I <coughs> Remember when I first arrived at Durham, I, I got involved in a project where we were looking at recovering waste heat from, from hot sea water that came out of oil wells in the North Sea, where they were using it for enhanced oil recovery. And I went to see my colleague, who was then John Lewis, the then head of the Earth Science Department, and I said, OK, John, how much, how much water is there? That was my first question, expecting to get so many pounds per second or so many kilograms per second. And I got, I can't remember the number, so many blue barrels per day. It wasn't even barrels, it was blue barrels. I have no idea what blue barrels mean. <laughs> so if I can't talk to a scientist, you know, what chance have I got talking to somebody from anthropology or to somebody from the English department? Well, the, the idea of the institute is to 
try and broker those, those conversations. So we have, we don't just have the Durham Energy Institute, we have uh, 10 of them, I think, if you count up there, three, six, yeah, nine is shown by the bars. This, this thing here is the Northeast Stem Cell Institute, it's a medical institute, and, and the reason why it doesn't have its own bar is that's the only one that's split between all the girls outside of Durham University. So that is a, uh, a collaboration between Durham and Newcastle University. All the other institutes sit purely within Durham, within Durham, uh, within Durham itself. So we have the Durham Energy Institute, I'm going to tell you about that at the top there, and you can see we, we pride ourselves on bridging all three of the faculties. We work quite closely with, with many of the other institutes, and there's a, an Institute of Hazard Risk and Resilience, um, so lots of disaster management type projects within that there's often overlap with the Energy Institute. The Institute of Advanced Research Computing, with data problems, um, uh, that again is Oftentimes, we find ourselves in projects where we link with them. And the Institute of Advanced Study, which is our, our overriding um, institute that's really there to accommodate scholars from other universities and scholars from outside, like the your industry people often, provides a home for them to come into the university and engage with us to deliver great value. And that's, that's really the ticket that Dominic and Sylvia came on. Um, when was it now? A year ago or so, wasn't it? Almost 12 months ago. Okay, so, so I'm going to tell you about the top bar there. So that's really our reason to exist now. Yes? Can I interrupt? Is there a reason the bar's not going all the way to the left? I knew somebody was going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> it's because we, we, we had no, I'm, I'm very sad you asked that question, <laughs> we had no traction in answering the humanities at all until Janet arrived, and, and uh, Janet, who's going to speak to me next, was really engaged with the Energy Institute, and now we're starting to, to get some purchase within that, that faculty. So, so, uh, I was maybe more generous to some of the other institutes and I should have been able to do them down. Um, but in our case, we can, we can certainly claim that we, we won't dip our toes in water. So, thank you. Okay, so that's why we exist. Now, the, the, uh, when, we, when the logo was kicked off yesterday, um, uh, new messages or new ideas were the theme that they wanted to come out of these discussions that we're having. Well, this isn't a new idea, but hands up anybody in the room who's heard of the trial? Trident, the energy trial. Yeah, one or two of us. Okay, and that's surprising because um, I've been listening to the conversations. In, in Europe, in, in the UK, everybody's talking about the trilemma. Everybody <laughs> hasn't made it over here, so if you want to break it down, go around talking about the trilemma. What does it mean? It, it means that little triangle there. So, what are we striving for? We're striving for an energy future where, where we decarbonise the grid, so we have low carbon energy, but that has to be affordable. Okay, which, which, and everywhere you look, every time you go to any new technology, the prices go up. You know, it's a, uh, uh, an inconvenient fact of life that if you want to generate cheap energy, you, you burn coal in the power station and, uh, without any clean up technology on the back end of it, and then you will get the lowest cost energy going. Uh, that's not acceptable anymore for very good reasons, and therefore that's being phased out, and um, everything else that comes along replaces it after what's possible. Okay, so affordability is a big issue, and security as well. Is uh, you need secure energy supplies. You know, it's, it's, it's apart from anything else, it's political suicide to, to let the lights go off. It happened in the 70s in, in, in the UK again. The Heath government. I was fortunately I can remember the 70s. So, uh, I was in my youth then, and I can uh, remember the papers shedding all the printed in the papers where your lights were going to go off for for the whole evening. And it led to the immediate downfall of the heat government at that time. So, apart from anything else, apart from all the implications of the hospital and all the rest of it, political suicides so that, that, uh, that, that the lights go off. But security also, I mean, in order to avoid that, there are some, some aspects to that that aren't often thought about. So, so, if you want a secure energy supply, you really need three things. Okay? You need fuel. Basically, if you want energy security, you need fuel to <coughs> security. Now, if you're talking about renewable energy forms, then maybe that's wind or solar, and that's all around you. That's fine. If you make your own money, but uh, the, the, way, the way the world's energy supply is going, how, to what extent does security and fuel supply uh, drive things? You know, we are in the UK, we are very nervous about 
about buying gas for the Russians and the, the implication that we have for us if, if suddenly that gas supply was turned off. But similarly with destabilisation of the Middle East and the French oil supplies and less energy prices change so much. But uh, again, it's the availability of fuel. But that's only one aspect of long-term security. And the other aspect is you've got to have adequate things and you've got to have enough generating capacity around of the right time when you need it. No use having 100% wind power and the wind doesn't blow, you know, there's no electricity then, so you need that. And the one that's most overlooked, and I haven't heard anybody make reference to it yet, and that's probably because it's, it's, it's very, very much taken forward with the scientists and engineers, that is, you also need stability to the system. So we were talking earlier on certainly about Germany and its move to, to a, a, a photovoltaic stroke wind stroke um, biomass uh, energy base. Well, the trouble with photovoltaic and wind, photovoltaics are generate DC electricity, and now the vast majority of the wind turbines that are installed will provide a variable speed wind turbines, so there's no link between the speed of the rotors go around and the frequency of the electricity that the generator is in the cell. Generators, they have what are called D fit generators, double effect induction one generators. But what that means is you're basically taking AC at some frequency that's dependent upon what's been blades going around, you convert it within the cell to DC and then back to AC again. And when you convert back to AC, you output it that AC at 60 Hz or 50 Hz. So it doesn't matter what speed blades are going around, you get the right frequency coming out. That's great, but the problem with those systems is there's no inertia to them. Uh, now, what is inertia? Well, if you imagine a conventional grid system, you have lots of large fossil plants or a large nuclear plant here in the UK, in the US, um, all going around with lots of stored energy within the rotors and the, the generator systems of those of those generators. They're all going around at 3,600 rpm in this country, so 60 hertz. And if demand and supply become unbalanced, okay. You've got a bit of time before things start getting too far out of control. Okay, so if, if suddenly demand goes up and you're not generating enough capacity, unless you bring more capacity online, the frequency starts to slow down. So you need to, so the, the operators will then bring more capacity online and that will help to maintain the frequency. If you lose your inertia, things happen too quickly. Okay, so, so you don't have enough time in order to correct and your frequency can wander outside of acceptable limits, and that has big, big implications for, for people. You know, things break. Um, uh, <coughs> the too much. So, so, the inertia side of security as well is a, is a big issue. You know, these, Denmark will tell you it generates at times 100% of its of its power from uh, wind. Uh, it does, but it relies very heavily on its connections to the countries surrounding it, which have lots of conventional plant on them still going away to keep its grid stable when it's generating 100 percent of If everybody tried to do it, the whole system at the moment uh, would go would go unstable. It just wouldn't work. Okay, so the trilemma is about those three things and really the Durham Energy Institute looks to attack issues around the trilemma, but not, from not just the pure science but also from the social science and the arts arts and humanities science. And we try to do really what it, what it says on the bottom of the slide here. So we try and put the two together and do you know, this, this nice word synergy. Uh, Some people to tell me synergy is when one plus one makes more than two. I guess that's a good definition of what we probably mean by that. So we try and leverage uh, additional value from, from linking the sciences with the social sciences. Okay. Just a little bit about the scale of us. We, when we last had a count up, we identified 145 researchers across Durham University with interests in energy spread across 14 departments. Uh, in terms of what are, do we have any particular strengths, Andrew Whitty is the, uh, is the CEO of uh, Glaxo, and he was commissioned by the UK government to do a report. You can, if you Google the Whitty report, you'll find it online. In the middle of that report has about 60 pages table on and it is the UK's top 20 universities in XYZ. So if you thumb through that you find that Durham came out highest in those tables for offshore wind, energy storage and oil and gas. So we have areas of expertise within the general field of energy, those, those are those are there. 
In terms of what I would try to do with the DEI, that's the five other points on the bottom of the slide, and the reason for being here now is that, uh, is that middle one there. But we have a big focus on uh, internationalization and trying to link with, uh, with other energy institutes internationally on rice. Uh, we're very pleased that, uh, if I'm honest, that rice came to us and made the first approach, and we welcome them down with the conscience. We see that it's a great international partner, and that's why we're here today. Okay, that's the that's the team. So I'm the director. Uh, I'm supported by four co-directors. Uh, we're a virtual organisation, so so I'm half caught up in the engineering department. I spend half my time in the institute, the other half of my time I spend uh, in engineering research and teaching. And then we have uh, four co-directors, and you can see the name there and the departments they're from. So the span of faculties, uh, and then one day we have. And then we have four, four other people on the bottom there that work all of their time for the DEI um, and basically run, uh, run the operation, perform the various roles that are listed for you there. Okay, very quickly, because I'm more or less out of time, I just want to talk about, about training and then there's a, there's a, I'll leave a presentation behind, there's a, a whole host of slides that come after this that show the research topics that, that, that we're into. We won't go through them now, we'll talk about some of them. Uh, in the presentations that are to come. But just to finish off from me on the training aspect, we, we pride ourselves as well within the, the Energy Institute of trying to support training at, at all levels. So right from what's not shown on this slide now, we're starting to uh, do some, uh, take some initiatives where we're going into schools and trying to sell the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the technical side of, of energy to, to high school students and trying to use them to become scientists and engineers, but also the social science of the, the uh, and the full, the full uh, uh, range of skills and disciplines that we're talking about here today, try to open people's eyes to the need for people in, in all areas of, uh, of uh, academic activity to engage with the energy, energy debate. Hopefully, we create the, uh, uh, the people of the future coming into the pyramid by those activities. Then we go up through undergraduate teaching, through MSc courses, PhD students, and eventually out the top supporting lecturers within within Durham University with fellowships, etc. All of which trying to work out with the most energy research in Durham and get people to go. So we have two MSc courses. We have this one here which we launched two years ago. So we run an MSc in Energy Society. That's very much a, a, a course that looks at the people side of, of energy use. So that's a, it's owned by the anthropology department, supported by the DEI been going for, for two years now um, and uh, it's, 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 it's at the heart really of what the, what the DEI does. That's a 12 month full time course so students come having completed a first degree and they do 12 months of study at Durham University and get a master's degree in energy and society as a result of doing that course. The other one we run is a technical course, it's only engineering, this is more something you might expect when you're a renewable energy technical wind turbines, PV, these sort of things as well, so we have that, that energy process as well. Okay, all right, so I'm going to stop there, um, and I'll make these slides available, as I say, afterwards there are, I mean, after this there are a number of slides that give ideas of the research activity that we're involved in across the field, and we're going to talk about some of that in a minute. Okay.